that are receiving uh, other awards at this conference, including Michael Spring from Miami and Dade County, who's getting the Selena Roberts Autumn Award, and Flora Maria Garcia, who's receiving the Michael Newton Award. It gives me great pleasure to know that there are advocates for public art that are also being recognized throughout this conference, and that means a lot. Presented every year, these awards recognize the achievements not only of individuals, but to organizations and programs committed to enriching their communities. The Public Art Network Award is given annually in recognition and honor of innovation and creative contributions and exemplary commitment and leadership to the field of public art. This is a big deal for us. It can be given to either an individual, including an artist or an administrator, a volunteer, a designer, or even a government official, and an organization, including an arts council, public art program, or private or public entity. The award is presented by Americans for the Arts Public Art Network and Advisory Council. PAN is designed to provide services to the diverse field of public art and to develop strategies and tools to improve communities through public art. Its key constituencies are public art professionals, visual artists, design professionals, and communities and organizations planning public art projects and programs. The PAN Council is a group of elected leaders from the Americans for the Arts members who provide advice on public art programs and services. Uh, I feel like this is a pre-conference, so I have the honor of doing a pre-introduction. And I'm going to introduce the person who's going to introduce Barbara. So there you go. Uh, I was asking Rochelle Branch. And she said, just think new Rochelle. See, East Coast, West Coast. There you go. Uh, this is one. Uh, Rochelle is also one of the great leaders in this field. And being the director of cultural affairs for the city of Pasadena, she has had the distinction of, not, of, of knowing Barbara not only uh, for her professional work, but in a very direct way, as Barbara has worked on the, on the master plan there. We talk a lot in this field, and certainly this conference will focus a lot on best practices. I cannot think of a person in our field who has made a stronger uh, commitment to best practices as a fierce advocate for artists and for the public realm. Barbara brings intelligence, passion, and commitment. And forgive me for upstaging probably the wonderful words you're going to say. But now, it's my pleasure to introduce Rochelle Branch, who will introduce Barbara. Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today to talk about Barbara Goldstein. So many of you know her work. So many of you have consulted with her over the years. You've seen some of the projects that she's worked on. You're familiar with her and her uh, role as public art planner. Um, I'm not going to go through all of her resume today. I want to talk a little bit on a personal level about the work that she's done with us in the city of Pasadena. And I have to read it, sorry. So I'm here to present the 2016 Public Art ne Network Award, which does recognize innovative contributions and exemplary commitment to the field. Barbara Goldstein is truly an innovator, a public art professional who is well known throughout the country as one of the public art pioneers, <laughs> which is kind of funny because she's one of the hippest ladies you'll ever meet. Her career includes the establishment of the City of Los Angeles's Percent for Art Requirement, director positions at the City of Seattle and San Jose, and consulting projects throughout the nation. She is well known to most, if not all of us, as many of us have consulted with her throughout the years. She's also the author of Public Art by the Book, which is a standard in the field. Barbara is both policymaker and practitioner, public art planner, and pragmatic consultant, and she is an artist advocate. It was in her role as public art planner that I first began to work with Barbara. She was intrigued, which is a good word, 
uh, by a little stalemate we had in the city of Pasadena uh, between the historic preservation community and the arts community uh, over a project in the Civic Center area. Very highly visible project. It was an entirely fabricated contention, but Barbara was able to come into our community and de-escalate the protagonists to eventually uncover the core problem and reach a compromise that was helped helpful to reunite these groups who, as you know, served on some of the same boards and had overlapping interests. It was her willingness to listen to the contrary positions that helped inch the bar along. She is pragmatic, and that's a quality that I admire. Um, as a part of her career and a part of her professional development, um, she recently was a fellow at Stanford University's, correct title here, Distinguished Career Institute. She was one of the first year fellows of that program. And I think that's really important, Barbara, because it was kind of a, a bookend, so to speak, to uh, many years worth of practice um, with your personal dedication to public art and certainly an acknowledgement of the reason we're here today to honor you. So our work in Pasadena has continued beyond the development of the public art master plan towards the implementation of many key projects. Throughout the years that I've worked with Barbara, and I hope it will continue for many more, she has been a steady, competent, an advisor, and a diligent listener, which is sometimes hard for all you Taurus people out there, and you know who you are. <laughs> you know who you are. So just as important as it is to acknowledge the successes we've had, we're here to honor all of the work that she's done for all of you. I have great friendship, admiration, and it is my pride to congratulate Barbara, um, who is here with her husband, Richard, who I will ask to stand. <laughs> Richard? John, no wonder. He's like, <laughs> who, who is it? Who is it? Okay, jet lag, everybody, jet lag. Please, st <laughs> Please stand, John. I'd like to honor you. Please join me in congratulating Barbara Goldstein on a truly distinguished career indeed. It's a well-deserved award, and it is my honor to introduce Barbara. Okay, uh, I have a couple of announcements to make. First of all, <laughs> if anybody lost a brass button, I have it. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, it's really great to be here in Boston. I went to college in Providence and I worked here every summer and, um, and also during my winter terms and it's really wonderful to be able to be here and see all the changes. I'm very honored to be given this award um, today especially in the context of Americans for the Arts, is someone whose main job is finding ways to promote the ideas and thinking of artists. I'm a little embarrassed, actually, to be placed in the spotlight. Basically, everything that I know about public art, I've learned from you, from conferences, from colleagues, from what, visiting different places. And I've also learned from listening to people and repeating back what I've heard and building on it to advance new ideas. Yes, I've built on what I've seen and what I've heard, but it's really the ideas of others that have inspired me and moved me forward. If I could move the slides forward, that would be really great. <laughs> okay, 
So uh, given the chaos that surrounds us right now, art might not be the uppermost thing in people's minds. However, I think that if we need anything in this country, it's a means of building community, bridging the differences between people and promoting human understanding. Public art does that. It's a means of connecting people and connecting the work of building cities, which so many of us are involved in. Public art is often one of the few areas that, that ordinary people have something to say. We get to actually get people to participate in building cities and creating places. And I think the Conflict Kitchen is a really good example of that because it brings people in direct contact with people from other countries. It's been very exciting for me placing artists and residents in different places from water utilities to communities of homeless teens or Asian Americans, um, aging Asian Americans. And if you, if you work officially in the public sector, and those of you that don't actually work in government are still working in public, one of the things that I've thought about a lot is the fact that we, what we're doing is actually a radical act. A lot of people think that working in the public sector means that you're gonna water things down and that you're gonna be doing things that are conservative in nature. But the fact of the matter is, government has an agenda, and the agenda that government has is a very important one. It's a democratic agenda. We care about people. We care about fairness. We care about promoting respect among different people. We care about education. We care about environmental awareness. And art is a means of accomplishing these things and allowing people to reach lofty goals without words, without barriers, and in a visceral way and with grace. And that's what's important about our field. Here are a few key philosophical underpinnings to what I've learned over the years. Whoops, sorry. What is happening here? I'm sorry. This one, okay, sorry. First of all, public art's like a library. This is something that I learned from Richard Andrews, who was one of the really important first leaders in public art in Seattle. Libraries have lots of books. You may not like all the books in the library, but you're really glad that they're there. Nobody's gonna like everything in your collection, not even you. I know I don't like a lot of the things that I've commissioned, but that doesn't matter. I wouldn't put the things that are in my house in public, but I would like to see that the public is served by the art that we create. Diversity of style, media, and size make what is what makes an interesting collection. When I started in San Jose, this argument became very handy for me because whenever I spoke about public art, people talked about two pieces. The first was the Thomas Fallon sculpture, which was intended for the north side of Cesar Chavez Park. And the second was a piece called Quetzalcoatl, which is this. Many of the Latino community were deeply offended by the Fallon sculpture because Fallon was the person who captured San Jose from the Pueblo to San Jose and took it away from the Mexicans. Now, we, our population in San Jose is about 30% Mexican American, and many of the people there have their roots going back to well before Thomas Fallon. So when the proposal was to put the Fallon sculpture at the north end of Cesar Chavez Park, you could imagine that it was somewhat controversial. Um, other people were offended by Quetzalcoatl, which is the Aztec god of science and creativity, because despite the fact that it was created by a hometown artist, Robert Graham, Robert Peña Graham, and is a replica of a sculpture in Teotihuacan, many people seized on its color and its appearance and compared it to dog excrement which is really offensive to the other community. Both pieces, though, have continued to stimulate conversation, and that's a good thing, because in effect, they're two sides of the same coin. The second principle, everybody has an opinion. I love that. I think it's really important, and I learned from my friend in, in Nashville, Sandra Duncan, to smile and say when somebody says they hate something, I'm so glad that you have an opinion. I think that's really important. It's a way of opening up a conversation. Usually people look at you and they say, what? You know? But the fact is that when somebody is upset about something, it opens up a conversation, and that's what's important about our field. Yep. 
finding her, having her trouble again. The third thing is grow the field. We all benefit when new people enter the field. I think that my biggest contribution to public art is having helped to organize three Public Art 101 conferences, which eventually became a book, and being able to um, work with um, public art administrators and work with, um, s with young artists to create workshops for emerging artists and bring new people into the field. We all benefit when there are new people that are coming into our field. The last thing is learn from your mistakes. We all make, my mista make, make mistakes, and in my experience, some of the most unexpected things arise in public art. Something happens in every single project, and there's something to learn from that. And so I'm going to quickly share a couple of my mistakes with you because I think they're really kind of interesting. First of all, when I started in Seattle, the, the, I was the, it was the job of my, as my director to to take care of a few things that were at loose ends. I was asked to cancel three projects and to deal with two projects that were in the center of drama. The first one was Hammering Man, which had recently been altered on Labor Day with a ball and chain by a guy named Subculture Joe. <laughs> Solving this problem was fairly easy. We negotiated with the museum and with artist, and artist Jonathan Borofsky to recognize Labor Day and Day Without Art by turning Hammering Man's arm off. However, when the artwork was altered again the following Christmas <laughs> by a couple of guys that fabricated a gigantic uh, Santa hat and floated it to up to the top of Hammering Man's head with helium balloons, it was a little bit more challenging. <laughs> because basically the museum feels that an artwork on their front steps is, is a work in the museum and therefore it shouldn't be altered. And so one of the things that I learned was that you really need to make a distinction between art that's truly public and art that might be in a sculpture park that belongs to a museum. The second problem, Wall of Death, was a lot more of a challenge. Artist Ma Maury Baden's first proposal had been rejected. He had proposed cladding the Bainbridge Ferry overpass in downtown with a sculpted garbage truck, basically implying that people coming over from Bainbridge Island to Seattle were entering garbage. Um, when he couldn't get that site, he suggested a spot on the scenic Burke Gilman Trail um, and created a project that was an abstract representation of a velodrome where bike races took place. And they, these things were described as wall of death. Well, believe me, when you put a sculpture that says wall of death on a very popular trail, people are going to get upset. And this is kind of what happened. Oops was supposed to animate. So we got um, a nice front page story about people not seeing any beauty in this art and we got a really nice editorial cartoon saying look at this thing if you can't sell it you can sell it to the the um, Seattle Arts Commission for a hundred thousand dollars. So, I mean, this was a really wonderful challenge to deal with. And so, basically what we did was we created, we wrote an op-ed piece about the value of public art, and it went away. The issue went away. The artwork is still there, and it has continued to be controversial for a variety of reasons that I won't go into, but um, the issue went away. And what I learned was that today's newspapers are tomorrow's recycling. That's a really good thing to remember, actually. And there was one last artwork on the to-do list. It was a $70,000 artwork by, by artist Jeffrey Mitchell, who was a very well-known bad boy and a well-regarded ceramic sculptor. Jeffrey had been paid two-thirds of his contract when I started by the previous public art director to create a concrete frieze on the building and a cast concrete garden. Unfortunately, he had spent most of the money to make a down payment on a house and the IRS had claimed the rest of it. Um, so when I got there, he only had $10,000 left, and he couldn't pay the fabricator to create the cast concrete sculpture. What we did was negotiated with his attorney, and we agreed to give him an extra $4,000 in exchange for the watercolors that he had done to describe the piece. And we got him to make the piece in ceramic, which is his medium in a hard-fired ceramic. And so it looked really good. Um, people liked it. It's very cute. It's in a neighborhood that's full of little windmills. It was a Swedish neighborhood. 
and everything seemed absolutely fine until the day that um, I heard from the local newspaper and she saw sexual imagery in the sculpture. She felt that the elephant and the little um, perda or whatever you call it on top of his back represented the artist's genitals and she also found a knot hole in the bottom of the stump that said, husbands love your wives. And this she felt was a sexual innuendo. So of course what we had to do was go to the city attorney and figure out whether this was sexual harassment. Well I learned something really important that I hope you all put this in your head because you may need it someday. There is something in law that is called the reasonable person criterion. And that means that you can send six reasonable people to look at a piece of art and if they don't think it's offensive, it's not. The city attorney sent six law clerks there and they couldn't find anything wrong with the sculpture. They thought it was quite wonderful. And when the newspaper article came out, the head of Seattle City Light threw it back at his liaison and said, who cares, it's just the weekly. <laughs> Another challenge that I inherited when I went to Seattle, when, when I went to San Jose was that we have a wonderful children's zoo and amusement park. It's called Happy Hollow Zoo and Park. And Red Grooms was supposed to create the sculpture, but he had to back, back out. So we um, had a limited competition. We involved Tom Otterness. Uh, Tom created a wonderful piece of sculpture that is called Another World that had the animals at the zoo visiting the kids, uh, visiting the uh, amusement park. And it was all wonderful. We thought it was really great. We were negotiating the contract with the city attorney. She discovered that as a young artist, Tom Otterness had made a film of himself shooting a dog. Now, this is no joke, and I, some of you all may have also discovered this, but we were already into the contract. We had to go to city council. It was a million-dollar project, so we had to work out a, a scheme where we worked with the animal rights people, we worked with the zoo, and we worked with the press to write a nice piece about how people make mistakes, and, and as they get older, they regret those mistakes, but it shouldn't prevent them from being able to do things that they do. So that was all good. We got the contract and everything, and he created the sculpture. It looked wonderful. Um, there's Danny the Dragon, who was one of the rides, and there's Danny's dad waving to him from a little model police car that was in the park, two capybaras facing each other, a little monkey in a police car. And then, <laughs> this is what came off the truck. It was not actually part of the original piece. So the, the PR person for the zoo said, oh, that's really great because everybody knows that that monkey gets really excited when blonde women walk by. <laughs> An hour later, we get phone calls call about the fact that this might be sexual harassment. So what I have to tell you is the best part of this project was seeing senior staff from the city sitting around a conference table talking for about a week about monkey penises. <laughs> Should we cut it off? <laughs> Should we put a fig leaf on it? Should we ask the artist to alter it? Well, the bottom line is that it wasn't placed in the park. It was an extra piece. It's brought out every year when they have their, their annual adults go to the zoo hoot and howl <laughs> event. And because it's holding a couple of coins, they put it right near where they ask for the money. Nobody noticed that there was another little penis here. <laughs> but the kids loved looking at it. The kids, <laughs> I mean, really, do, do, do we put diapers on the monkeys in the zoo? I don't think so. <laughs> the last thing was that the zoo director discovered that there was money every place. The parrot in the middle, who's wearing a top hat, was dropping money onto the guinea pigs underneath. The zebu was eating bills and pooping coins. And the three little pigs, the, um, the, the wolf had money sticking out of his back pocket. This was right after the financial crisis, by the way. And the two of the pigs had a hammer and sickle in their hands. 
So we got through that. We brought the reasonable, pe reasonable people around, and the assistant city manager said, you know what? Art is supposed to work on a number of different levels. This is really great because the kids are going to enjoy it, and the adults are going to enjoy it, and everybody's going to get something out of this. It's kind of like watching Pee Wee's Playhouse, right? Unfortunately, the last thing that happened, and this is why you have to learn from your mistakes, it's a very hot plaza, bronze gets hot, they put fences around the pieces, currently the pieces in the summertime are undercover, and the problem is the plaza, it's actually not the piece, but we are still struggling with that issue. So, I don't really know what to say about that, but you can't blame, lay, lay blame on it, but there's a problem all around. So the last piece that I learned is you've got to accept change and move on. We work in a political environment and it gets uglier all the time. I've seen many of my efforts dismantled and I've seen changes of political administration and political decisions. It's just something that we have to live with. However, I'm an optimist and I believe that it's possible to build relationships that encourage people to be their best and highest selves that art builds community and that by planting a small idea, a larger movement can grow. I'm extremely encouraged by projects like the Conflict Kitchen that I showed at the beginning that ask questions and promote understanding and by temporary projects that maybe not were done by, as part of our field but grew out of our field like Sing for Hope which brings people together around painted pianos and then gives the pianos to schools. Um, and the porch project that happened in, on the 30th Street Station in um, Philadelphia. These are projects that, that came out of public art thinking, maybe done by other designers, but they're things that bring people together, and that's really important. Our field continues to evolve. We have huge support from the National Endowment for the Arts, from Art Place, the Knight Foundation, Kresge, Rauschenberg Foundation, and others that are promoting creative placemaking and community building through the arts. Our, and this is a wonderful thing. I really appreciate the recognition that you've given me today, and I look forward to seeing how you advance community and understanding through your work and to continuing my participation in this crazy and wonderful field. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. That was fabulous. So here we are. Um, it's almost 10 o'clock, so we're wrapping up our morning session, and now we're going to start heading down for tours. Um, hopefully all of you have your tickets by now and you're signed up for one. If not, Boston's an awesome city anyway. You can still walk around. Um, <laughs> still, um, we'll be meeting back here at 1, and we'll have lunch in this room um, all set up for you guys when you get back. So have a lovely morning, and I'll see you in a few hours or in a few minutes if you're going on a tour. <laughs>